quickly jump back to this question of the black political class or the PMC, POC, Adolf, as you called it. Um, so in, in your piece, you um, well, I guess I should say I, I do feel like especially on the left or among progressives these days, there is kind of this understanding that oftentimes, um, you know, the people who are sort of the self-appointed spokespeople for a certain race or whatever um, are they claim to speak on behalf of an entire group. It's kind of unclear like what they're, whether they have an authentic or organic connection to that group. Um, but in your piece, you point out that uh, this criticism sort of takes the form oftentimes of uh, calling these people sellouts, right? Or like talking about them as a sort of misleadership, like the misleadership of, of you know, the black working class or whatever. Um, so I guess the question for you guys is, why is this an incomplete or in or an inadequate way of thinking about the relationship between the black political class to the working class? Oh, yeah. OK, I'll start off. Um, uh, I think what's 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 problematic about it is that it presumes the organic connection between you know, the spokespersonship stratum mm -hmm. and and the masses, which is another construct I don't especially like. Because mm -hmm. uh, it tends to be the reciprocal of the leaders, right? And like the thing about a mass is that it's mute, so that's perfect from the standpoint of the <laughs> people who grab the microphone. Um, but yeah, so like it assumes, and 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 look, look, I can give a mea culpa to this one because this is like you know part of the pathology that my specific age cohort helped to bring to politics. I mean, you know, others had it before us. Like I've I've been struck. You know, by how much my father's popular front cohort uh, tended uh, of, 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 of black activists and intellectuals tended to fall into this kind of thing, thing too. But there's a tendency. So the problem with that formulation, right, with, with the formulations that give us, you know, the misleadership or sellouts is that it posits an organic black population that has a coherent singular interest. And that these people, these guys and dolls, um, have somehow been unfaithful to and, and have um, deviated from the mission of, 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 of advancing, right? Um, but there never was that organic population, so there couldn't have been a mission, right? And... And, and, and we're looking at it in particular from the perspective of the emergence of the post-1965 black political class, that misunderstanding has been crucial to this stratum's ongoing political legitimation, right? Uh, because, uh, because the claim, right, it, it all hinges on the claim, just as it did for Booker Washington on that hot September day in 1895, that he knew what was best for the Negro. Right. Um, and 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 that we somehow share an interest that is larger than uh, lies beneath our discrete social circumstances. Right. So I think that's what the problem with, with that is. And 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 I mean, the late Glenn, yeah, I mean, Glenn Ford is a great guy and and uh, uh, and, and whatever. But but like this is a. Um, a little nub between Glenn and me for a long time, because this was his you know, reflex was to um, you know, refer to them as the mis late leadership class. And I said, well, but that's only if you assume that they, that, that there is a leadership class, right. That, that, that speaks for the entire black, black population, except those individuals who get defined as sellouts. And, and see, this is also what makes it possible for instance, for like a group of people to show up and have a demonstration someplace and call themselves a movement, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, and so I mean, um, social media, right? Uh, you know, the proliferation of different kind of platforms of so social media has has facilitated the spread of this kind of bogus politics, right? And 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 uh, and the one might say has you know democracy. It. But I just sent an email I think, earlier today wondering what George Kingfish Stevens would be capable of, like if he were alive today, right, with all the social media platforms and with like Kennedy's access to, you know, his endowment, right? Um, but, but that's what the problem is. Um, but I hope that gets to what you're going for. 
Hooray, are you going to apologize for Gen X? (laughs) (laughs) What I will say is is my father would would, uh, attest to, I never liked them. That's quite true. I never liked them before I even knew we were called Gen X. So, um, (laughs) but I I would essentially endorse what he said, emphasis on essentially pun, um, insofar as, you know, the sellout framework clearly presumes that there's a unitary black interest and this gets us back to or or pick a blank fill fill, Mm -hmm. fill in a blank group interest Mm -hmm. and this gets us back to the problem of the fact that there are more blacks in the united states than there are canadians um, of any race and that no one imagines that there's a singular canadian interest so why would one imagine that there's a singular black interest ever but especially after 1964 and that isn't to say that black americans Um, aren't generally more likely than whites, let's say, to um, embrace some version of an active welfare state. But there's some caveats there, too, because conservative farmers embrace an active welfare state, too. Mm -hmm. But but if we just accept this narrative as we do, all right, so if it's true that Blacks are more likely than whites on average to embrace the welfare state, What's also true is that they might embrace it for different reasons, right, with different kinds of policy expectations. So in the 1990s, for example, in the Clinton years, I'd gotten into a lot of uncomfortable, uh, disappointing and infuriating conversations with fellow black Gen Xers. There we are, uh, (laughs) who were not remotely concerned, let's say, didn't share my concerns about Bill Clinton having signed AFDC out of existence. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, unfortunately, too many of my fellow petty bourgeois, black peers, Gen X peers, weren't concerned about that at the same time because they thought those lazy black people, disproportionately Mm -hmm. black and brown people needed to work harder. At the same time, they embraced affirmative action. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my argument then was that they're both from the rights perspective, they're both statist remedies. And at the very least, as I said to a number of my peers then, self-interest alone should encourage you to be outraged over welfare reform because it excised a a layer of fat between the scalpel and the policies that you like as a middle-class black or brown man or woman. Um, And it's thus, you know, it augurs something that's not good for your class stratum. But the point of the anecdote is that, and, and I think this is, pretty common uh, at the time and, and to this day is that you could look if you if you just burnish the surface just a little bit or maybe a, a little more than a little bit but if you, if you burnish the surface what you would find is that even as blacks embraced the welfare state they didn't have the same attachments to it and the attachments that that they had were often enough shaped by their class positionality And so middle class blacks often enough shared the same kind of contempt uh, for poor blacks that everybody else did uh, at that time. I mean, just to just to take this back to my thing about stand up comedians on this this topic, Mm -hmm. which relates to the next book that I will hopefully be writing for Verso. uh, Chris Rock's famous bit, the difference between black people and N word. Mm -hmm. was just that right i mean there Mm -hmm. was explicitly a line in there about a black man with three jobs working however many hours a week hates a you know woman uh on welfare right or Mm -hmm. it might have been a black woman with three jobs whatever um but nevertheless hardworking black people hate black people who are on welfare and who were the black people on welfare in that formulation they were the n-word right Mm -hmm. if you like this video from the jacobin show please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends thanks